All right, hi everyone, and uh, thank you for having us and for attending this session. It's called Leaning Into Less in Fear, How Structure Can Free Clinicians, Patients, and Their Fano and Exploring What Matters Most. So first, before we jump into our presentation, just wanted to stop for a couple of acknowledgements. So first, none of us uh, who are presenting have any conflicts of interest to disclose. And before we start, we wanted to pause to acknowledge that structural racism pervades the healthcare system in which we work. Explicit and implicit biases influence clinicians, researchers, and policymakers, which results in harm to patients and Pono. Uh, we are not experts in New Zealand culture and history, and we invite anyone attending this session to point out inaccuracies or insensitivities in our words. We pledge to stay committed to promoting justice, equity, tolerance, and fairness. Kia ora tato, ko Mount Hood, te maunga, ko Willamette River, te awa, no Oregon, aho, ko Lakin, toku Fano, ko Josh, toku ingoa. Ki ora tato, ko Cadillac, te mauna, ko Charles River, te awa. No Brooklyn, New York, USA, Aho. Ko Paladino, Toku, Fano. Ko Joanna, Toku, Inwa. Kiora Tato. Ko Kissing Breads, Te Mona. Ko Lake Erie, Te Awa. Ko Buffalo, New York, Aho. Ko Bernaki, Toko, Fano. Ko Rochelle, Toko, Inua. So we're delighted to be here today to describe um, the principles behind the Serious Illness Co Care Program, which is really a structured, systematic approach to um, ensuring that patients and families have the opportunities to talk with their clinicians about what matters most, and really to drive more, better, and earlier conversations. We really uh, designed the program to make it easy for clinicians to do the right thing, to have these conversations and to really take away the system barriers that make it difficult to initiate these conversations. However, in the last seven months since facing the COVID-19 pandemic, it's been really challenging to have these conversations. And we've noticed this ourselves as clinicians and that there's tensions in, in bringing this up. And we ourselves feel anxious as well as our patients are experiencing a high degree of anxiety along with our families. So today uh, we'll talk through some of that and think about ways to mitigate that anxiety, both on behalf of us to make us feel more comfortable, but also for those that we serve. And uh, we will talk about the less tested language that we've used in these conversations that are iterative. It's really important to make sure that these conversations can happen um, repeatedly. Um, we'll also spend a little bit of time talking about the challenges of doing these in, uh, in the virtual setting, like we are right now on Zoom, or even over the phone. So um, we're, with that, I'm delighted to turn this over to Josh, who will um, take us into the principles behind the Serious Illness Care Program. Thank you, Rochelle. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start today by uh, giving a little bit of background and kind of talking through this program and where it came from and why we think it can be helpful or aspects of it can be helpful for conversations that really drive anxiety. Um, and so first, just to take a step back and talk about what it is that we are talking about, we're focusing here today on talking about early conversations about what matters most to patients, their goals, their values, um, the things that they do that makes them feel like themselves, uh, things that make up a good day. Talking about those things for patients in the context of a serious illness and in the healthcare setting, we have evidence that that makes care better, right? And the evidence is a little complex. It's in specialty palliative care literature. It comes from advanced care planning information and, and studies, and then also from serious illness communication and kind of shared decision-making models. And what we've seen in those different studies is that talking to people about what matters to them helps to line up the care and the things that we do in the healthcare system with what matters most to them. So as best as we can measure it, and it's tough to measure, we are able to better serve the people that we are providing care for. 
We also see that we improve, or these conversations help to improve quality of life and patient well-being. Then in the United States, at least, we see more in earlier hospice care, which feeds back into some of those better patient outcomes, and also fewer hospitalizations, which is a place where end-of-life care is associated with kind of more, or with being in the hospital at the end of life is associated with more traumatic end-of-life experiences. And then probably most important for me as a palliative care clinician is these conversations improve the experience of serious illness. They allow for better patient and family coping and bereavement outcomes, making living in living the best you can in this difficult time um, easier, which is very important. However, if we do this, uh, if, or if you believe that we that these are good and helpful for patients, for FANO, for clinicians, we don't lean in. And we don't lean in for a lot of different reasons, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But we've, we've known and we've seen evidence that these conversations, they don't happen for many patients that need them. If they do, they tend to happen late in the last days to weeks of someone's life when there's not much time for us all to do our work. Uh, they tend to focus on what matters to us in the healthcare system. We ask people about do they want CPR and feeding tubes and medical things. We don't ask them about the things that matter to them and the way that they live their life. And then last, in the context of very complicated medical records and electronic medical records, they're hard to find. So if they happen, it's hard to get the information back out of the system. And the reasons for this are many, right? So we're, we've trained a lot of professionals and worked with a lot of different kinds of professions over the years doing this. And none of us are really well trained in how to do conversations like that. We each bring different skills, but we don't have great training as clinicians. Especially in the United States, there is fragmentation of care, multiple specialties, uh, multiple settings, and we ask patients to dance our steps rather than try and make it easy for them to come to us. Uh, there are variations in attitudes and beliefs and practice norms in serious illness communication, and they vary from specialty to specialty and place to place, which makes this challenging. There is a not an increasing notable attention to clinician burnout and moral distress across all different professions of clinicians. There are, these are difficult conversations, right? Emotions run high. There's reluctance on the side of both of us, patients, families, and clinicians. And there's also worries about harming each other, right? We worry about hurting our patients, talking to them about hard things, and our patients worry about us too, about disappointing us or making us sad. There's diverse cultural considerations around serious illness and death, and those vary immensely from place to place. There's prognostic uncertainty uh, about thinking about the future and planning for it. So what this all leads to is increased anxiety, right? amongst other things, but definitely increased anxiety amongst, as Rochelle pointed out, clinicians, FANO, patients, we all feel anxious in this space. So we lean back rather than leaning in to have these conversations. And on top of that, as Rochelle mentioned, these are extraordinary times and we are facing unprecedented challenges. So, well, you might argue that patients and clinicians and health systems all, and countries face kind of a burning platform to talk a little bit more about what matters to patients in the context of, of this pandemic. Um, we also see uh, that doing so involves negotiating some pretty complex and evolving situations, right? So patient care has changed. Patients are often in the room by themselves without, pa without family or visitors, or we're doing it like this. We're doing things over Zoom platforms or by telephone. Clinicians are working more and harder in a lot of places and often fearing for their own safety in the context of this virus. And at least in the United States, we have seen solid data that this virus and the way that the healthcare system in a country responds to it are worsening pre-existing systemic inequities and disparities. And so there's a lot of things that come together to make these times tougher. And what that real it, it does is it increases the anxiety further, right? So these are very anxiety-laden conversations right now. And yet, as I pointed out at the beginning of the slide, it's also really important to have them right now. So what I'm going to do a little next is talk a little bit about an argument that a framework and structure can help in times of anxiety. And so there are a number of different ways to kind of frame and structure these conversations. There's many good ones. 
we are we have worked the most in the context of the serious illness care program and so we'll use the serious illness guide as a conversation guide as an example of structure to think about how to use structure and lean on structure to ease anxiety and what the guide is is really a framework of best practices to help navigate a tough situation and it feels kind of weird to me as a palliative care doctor i was taught to follow the con patients in these conversations that, that conversations about goals and values goals of care there it's an art form which it is in many ways and at the same time a structure is helpful in, in, in times of anxiety and this guide is kind of comes out of the construct of checklists right and it's a kind of a weird thing to think of a checklist for a conversation like this at the same time if you think of the other applications of checklists they are built for uh, adding step or creating structure and steps to help people humans get through complex emotional uh, um, processes right so the great example the kind of the best example is landing a plane right so i imagine good pilots when people started to talk about putting a checklist together for landing a plane they would say but landing a plane is a complex art form where people you need us good pilots to do it and that is true and remains true however i think we've seen that taking that very complicated set of actions that it takes to land a flying extremely heavy piece of large metal with a bunch of people in it and putting it into steps helped increase the safety and consistency of landing a plane and it's not that this guide is a checklist but the idea of structure of following steps in times of anxiety when there's humans involved is where the idea comes from so let me talk a little bit about those key, key steps the scaffolding and structure that this guide is on so first is setting up the conversation so starting by laying the groundwork about what we are doing today to create space to do something different lead patients gently into a conversation and ourselves and get ourselves prepared to go through the conversation the next step is working to assess it, uh, patients information needs and family information needs so what do they understand or what have we already taught them as their clinicians about what's happening with their health or their body and then learning from them what they need from us so how much information do you want from us as we go through this conversation so learning where they are and how we can help is the next step then it's delivering a prognosis or delivering information about what the future will hold right so many at least in the doctor world people tend to think of delivering a prognosis as predicting how many hours or days someone will live with a constellation of illnesses but that's not what it's about for these conversations for these conversations it's about painting a view of the future in the very realistic uncertainty that we face so that we can make some shared decisions and thinking about how to best care for you as we go forward the next step is to explore what matters most to the patients ask them about their goals their values their fears and worries explore the kinds of things that they know about themselves that we can use as we think about their health and their health care and then last is pulling that all together, summarizing what we've heard, making sure that we heard them correctly, and then making a recommendation based on their goals for how to proceed forward. And the guide is the scaffolding, or those are the steps, but there's lots of things you need to do to be able to move between those steps. So I wanted to highlight some of the key skills that help us climb and navigate and slide through that scaffold. So like we mentioned, it's an emotion-laden conversation. So having some skills in responding to emotion is really important as you navigate this guide, tending to the emotion in the room, the patient, family, and our own. Asking clarifying questions. So in the context of cultural diversity, of uh, anxiety of around expressing what matters most to us, going deeper and asking some questions to get a better understanding about people's answers to these questions is an important skill on top of the scaffold next is asking permissions a critical skill in the context of anxiety uh, handing power and control over to patients in fauna and times when it's not a time when they feel in control and also uh checks right to make sure that they're ready to go forward not bulldozing ahead without their without them following along and then employing bookmark statements so capturing those things that come up that are really important that you need to come back to such as i hear that you're having afraid of having a lot of pain i have some thoughts about that but let me ask a few more questions then we'll really dig into the pain that you're afraid about and we'll work on that but i'm going to come back to it and then last listening carefully reflecting back making sure you're hearing them and also um, making sure that you're capturing and engaging them in the conversation 
So then last, just to point out, so as part of kind of thinking about this guide and bringing it to New Zealand, the New Zealand government um, a few years ago uh, took some time to think about adapting this to the setting in New Zealand. And they had three co-design workers with consumers and clinicians. And after getting input in locally, there's thinking and that led to a few key changes that I just wanted to point out. So first, uh, critical to the cultural work around medical decision-making in New Zealand is checking to make sure that we have the appropriate whanau in, in the meeting and that they are participating. So there's a, a dedicated step to that. As they went through the focus groups, they found that the word worried didn't work in this context. And so they've replaced that with the word concern. And then last, in the context of uh, New Zealand, which tends to be less religious, uh, there was some feedback on the strengths question from the American version of the guide. And the question was replaced with what helps you through the tough times. It was a wonderful example of getting kind of collective broad input into, uh, into the structure that we had started with and, and adapting it locally. So I encourage you all to take a look at that. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Joe, who's gonna walk through some more of the data and the impact of the program and the guide. As Josh mentioned, there are many systemic forces and obstacles that get in the way of having high quality, meaningful conversations about what matters with patients and those they love. And so as a program, we designed the Serious Illness Care Program to see if we could close some of the gaps that we see based on this idea that health systems need a process and a systems approach to support these conversations to happen with high quality and routinely uh, as part of care. And so the Serious Illness Care Program includes clinical communication tools like the Serious Illness Conversation Guide that we just saw, the guide is also paired with supportive materials for patients and their families, as well as clinician training programs and system supports, such as locally driven workflows to integrate conversations into very busy clinical practices and electronic health record templates to document conversations in an accessible location in the medical record so um, they can be found. So I'm going to share what we're learning from our research efforts about the experience and impact of having these conversations using a structured approach. We tested this intervention with tools, training, and systems changes in a randomized clinical trial in oncology with 91 oncology clinicians and 278 patients with advanced cancer. Nearly 60% of the patients died uh, during the trial. We found that this intervention led to more earlier and better conversations about what matters to patients. So to give you an example, nearly 90% of patients in the intervention group who died had a documented discussion with their clinician about their personal values and goals compared to fewer than half of patients in the control group. Conversations also happened significantly earlier in the illness course, about five months before death compared to two and a half months. And this gives patients and their families more time to plan and prepare for the future with their illness. We also found that the intervention resulted in less significantly less emotional suffering for patients, including half the rates of moderate to severe anxiety and depression symptoms for patients in the intervention group compared to the control group, and lower rates of anxiety persisted for months after the conversation. We didn't see an effect on goal concordant care or peacefulness at the end of life or on resource use or healthcare utilization at the end of life. Um, we had a lot of trouble implementing those measures and this really highlights the need for better measures that capture the experience of care and the impact of these conversations over the trajectory of care and not just at the end of life. We also wanted to learn and understand from patients and clinicians um, about their experience with these conversations using a structured guide. And so what we found when we studied this is um, in our oncology trial, there was high uptake of the serious illness conversation guide with 87% of clinicians using the guide and 90% reporting that the guide was effective and helpful in, in helping them understand patients' values and priorities. And the average time of the conversation was 14 minutes. So they can be, you can build this conversation into a routine visit during practice. 
and 80% of patients found this conversation to be worthwhile. And in their own voices, patients described the impact of these discussions on their lives. For example, some patients shared that the conversation helped them plan their medical care, such as making a list of my last wishes, such as when I can no longer go to the bathroom by myself, I would like hospice. Other patients talked about enhanced communication with their family members. For example, this patient mentioned talking to their two grown children about how they're doing. I don't wanna keep them in the dark, so nothing will be a shock. Patients also reported um, a focus on, on planning practical activities, surfacing of their goals and their priorities, as well as a direct improvement in their own well-being, such as feeling less anxious about the future. Patients also shared that this conversation helped them feel more connected and closer to their clinician. So in having these conversations in summary, we learned that we're seeing the impact on patients' lives and not just on their medical treatments, and that when asking patients open-ended questions about what matters, patients felt more prepared to face subsequent health challenges, more connected to their clinicians and loved ones, and also more empowered to set and achieve goals without added distress and actually with better psychological outcomes. And so um, moving on to primary care work, we were really thinking a lot about how this program could be adapted to the primary care context. And we conducted an implementation research trial that was led by Josh and Rochelle and colleagues in primary care at our home institution, testing this intervention, tools, training, and systems changes in primary care with interprofessional clinicians who care for patients as part of a care management program. So this included nurse care managers, social workers, advanced practice clinicians and physicians, primary care physicians. Um, as you can see, many of the patients in this, um, who were part of this trial had multiple illnesses and many were older adults. We found that this program led to more, more accessible and more comprehensive conversations, which were documented in a more accessible location, which is important because it makes the information actionable um, to other clinicians who care for the patients. And one of the biggest learnings from our work in primary care re really focused on expanding how we think about prognostic communication. So as clinicians, sharing prognosis is one of the hardest things that we do. Um, it's difficult for clinicians. It's also really difficult for patients and loved ones to hear difficult news about what may be ahead with an illness. And most people think of prognosis as focusing on life expectancy. Not only is time increasingly difficult to predict, but it's not always the most helpful information for pa patients and families. Um, some patients may not wanna know about time. For others, they may wanna know information about the future, but they may wanna know, but they may want their families to have this information or to have this information together with their families. And so we really heard, learned from our primary care colleagues that helpful prognostic information relates also to fu anticipated functional changes, as well as pre preparing for an unpredictable sudden changes in the future. And so um, on the guide, we expanded the prognostic framework to include time, function, and unpredictability. And this is really supported by research. Um, this is research um, from colleagues out in San Francisco. Um, this is a study in older adults who showed, that showed that 75% of diverse older adults want to know their prognosis. And the reasons they want to know about the future are not just about the medical details. So the, the most common reason is to prepare for the future. Patients also wanted to have information to make the most of life and to make medical and health related decisions. And so here is an example of a prognosis that really focuses on function. I hope that you can maintain as much independence as possible and we will work toward that goal. I'm also worried that you may get weaker over time and it may not and may not be able to live on your own as your illness progress or as your disease progresses with a pause to allow silence for the patient and or their family to process. In this instance, this is a patient who may have years to live and discussing a functional prognosis can help the patient, family, and clinician make plans to maximize the patient's independence, especially if that's a primary goal and priority for the patient to maximize the patient's independence as much as possible and also prepare for future changes. How can we give patients meaningful in information in the face of un unpredictability? 
Here's an example of, of this kind of prognosis. It can be difficult to predict what will happen with your illness. I hope you will continue to live well for a long time and we'll keep working toward that goal. I'm also worried that you could get very sick suddenly. And I think it's important for us to prepare for that possibility, pausing and allowing for silence again. So what's consistent here is the hope, worry, or hope concern model and hope prepare language. And one of the primary roles of these conversations is to really provide emotional support using compassionate, compassionate language, pausing, taking a breath after sharing news to, to give time for the patient and their family to process. And this creates space to respond to their emotions. And so one of the takeaways from this to address the anxiety that comes with thinking about the future with an illness and planning for the future, prognosis has to be personal and really has to be tailored to the patients and their families' unique communication needs. And so even before sharing prognosis, asking what kind of information would be helpful and how pa patients want to receive that information can really help clinicians um, tailor the prognostic information to the patient's needs. And in addition to different illnesses, um, people have enormous diversity of cultural backgrounds and social contexts that inform their experience. And so we're at a moment um, with the pandemic during a time of significant social change in which new light is being shed on longstanding and deep-seated systemic inequities and systemic racism and the dis disproportionate negative effects on the health and well-being of communities and people of color. And so partnering with communities as well as health systems that serve people who are underrepresented and marginalized by our system is a focus of our program and many others in healthcare. And so early work um, for some of this early work for our program involved conducting focus groups in partnership with colleagues in South Carolina. And these focus groups um, took place with African American patients with advanced cancer and their caregivers, as well as members of a church group in South Carolina to really gain their perspectives on the serious illness conversation guide, as well as what supported and got in the way of these conversations with their clinicians. And one of the main learnings from this, this qualitative work was that the serious illness conversation guide was acceptable and participants reported that the open-ended questions were an improvement to the communication to which many were accustomed, which in and of itself really highlights the systemic inequities that exist in access to high quality person-centered conversations. We also learned about changes to the conversation guide that were really important for the guide to be more inclusive and impactful. One example is a question that focuses on sources of strength, helps to develop rapport and demonstrates um, respect. And it also enables bringing in a faith and family into these discussions, which are really important in the communities in which um, this research took place. Um, in addition to that, the conversation setup and closing should emphasize non-abandonment on non-abandonment. As part of this, we added, I will be with you through this at the close of the guide to demonstrate our continued relationship with patients and non-abandonment. And, and also providing communication about prognosis according to patients' preferences with emphasis on a shared hope for a desired outcome really helps patients and families prepare for the future with their illness. This also links to some of the prognostic language that I had shared earlier about this idea of hoping for a shared outcome while also preparing for the future with potential changes. And so here's an example of a quote that came from this research. Uh, some doctors don't know how to really talk to us, but if we, serious illness or not, if we consider these questions, we will have something on our side besides having nothing. And so what we're building towards is a framework for what serious illness conversations or, or conversations about what matters with patients can do for people with serious illness and their family. And so we're learning that these conversations can help build trust and rapport. They can help us learn as clinicians about the patient and family and what matters to them, share information using compassionate language, respond to emotion, allowing silence, listening more than talking, especially using open-ended questions, and then being mindful and considerate of the timing, the setting, and the patient and family context. This is really toward helping us really know patients as people and also know them in the context of their families and their communities. And what can patients and families experience in these conversations? Feeling known, valued, and respected as individuals, as people, heard and understood, getting emotional support, attention to and relief of anxiety and distress, 
feeling trust that their care team knows what's important to them and that what's important to them is driving their care, feeling informed and prepared for the future, feeling closer to their clinicians and empowered with a sense of control and agency to really set and achieve goals and to make plans for the future. And we're thinking about, you know, in terms of these conversations, how can we ensure that patients feel known and cared for and cared about on their own terms? And what are we learning about clinician experience? Um, we have an epidemic of burnout and um, this has been made worse and, uh, by the COVID pandemic. And we have a long way to go to improve it. And there are many factors that are the root causes of, of, of burnout. We, we do know that moral distress and moral injury are highly prevalent in clinicians who care for people living with serious illness and that this has been linked to burnout and that this in part comes from feeling, um, feeling unable to prevent unnecessary suffering for patients and families and feelings of powerlessness to in intervene. And so we have some descriptive data from our randomized trial in oncology to support the potential for meaningful conversations about what matters to patients to improve clinician experience and meaning at work. This is prom promising, but it needs more rigorous study. And so we found, for example, that 70% of oncology clinicians reported that their satisfaction in their role increased after using this structured approach to conversations about what matters. Nearly two thirds reported that using the serious illness conversation guide, guide helped their anxiety or improved their anxiety in having these discussions. And 82% of oncology clinicians reported that they would want a, a, a conversation using the serious illness conversation guide if they themselves had a serious illness. We also learned from this work, um, this isn't featured here, but nearly 60% of patients that had this structured conversation reported enhanced closeness with their, with their clinician. And so we've been gathering some narratives from clinicians about the impact that using the conversation guide has had on them. And, I'll, and on their patients, and I'll, I'll give you a few examples. The conversation took me about 15 minutes. And in those 15 minutes, I feel like I learned a vast amount of information that humanized my patient and gave me a very clear idea of his wishes, fears, and thoughts on the future. The patient and his family were much more at peace with decisions moving forward. Another example from a primary care physician, my experience with using the serious illness conversation guide is that it opens the door for patients to feel comfortable sharing their feelings and emotions in the presence of family and their trusted provider. And an oncology nurse shared that these conversations create space for the unspeakable to be spoken, for the unspeakable to be spoken, which alleviates a weight. And when she talked about this, she talked about how it alleviated a weight, not only for her patient, but also for herself. And so what is the impact of these conversations on relationships and connection between patients, families, and clinicians? This is one core area of, uh, of future research for our program. I think what we're learning is that interventions, training, and systems level change, system level changes that truly prioritize relationship building, meaningful, respectful conversations have the potential to transform clinical practice, improve care quality, and lead to positive experiences for patients with serious illness, those they love, as well as the clinicians who care for them. And so we just wanted to thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. And we really look forward to discussing this with you in the question and answer period. Thank you.